And uh, just doing a quick sound check, if folks could, uh, maybe a few of you could type into your chat window uh, that you can hear us loud and clear and see the screen. We'd much appreciate that. And we'll be starting in just uh, one more minute. Uh, we'll give folks uh, another minute or so to join, and then we'll kick off. Thank you. Okay, I, I think we'll kick off now. I want to take a minute to welcome everybody to the first of a three-part series uh, on re rebuilding content during a content migration. Um, I'm Brian Trombley, National Sales Director at Data Conversion Laboratory, and as I said, this is the first of a three-part series, uh, and uh, we're, we're pleased to have Marley Messabov um, join us today. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to uh, introduce you to DCL and the services we provide. Um, but the bulk of the presentation will be Marley. And um, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Um, there is a, a question panel uh, on your, um, your control panel or your, your uh, go to webinar panel. So please feel free to uh, submit questions through that interface. And at the end of the presentation, we will have about 10 to 15 minutes for the Q&A session. Um, today's presentation, again, this is the first of a three-part series, is really about developing your story. And with short attention spans and a barrage of information coming at us every day, it would be easy to assume, assume that short taglines are the way to go when crafting copy. But long copy has been shown to be more effective. And why is this? Well, it's because users love stories. And that is how we as humans relate to one another and understand context. Content strategist Marley Messabov will explain how, through storytelling, content strategists can deliver backstories to engage and connect with users as we have connected with one another since the beginning of time. So this webinar is designed to enlighten you about the power of stories and give tips on how to use them in your content. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just a, a quick few moments about Data Conversion Laboratory. DCL has been in, at the forefront of data conversion and data enrichment for almost 33 years. Um, we have complex content experience. We provide unparalleled infrastructure and leading edge technology. And that supports DCL's passion to deliver the highest quality results and the best value to our clients. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, focus areas for DCL, document digitization, XML and HTML conversions, ebook production. Uh, we have automated hosted solutions for high volume uh, conversions. Uh, we, more recently with the advent of big data as a big buzzword, uh, we have solutions 
uh, around automating big data type conversions. Um, we work with a number of clients who uh, produce their own conversions but need experience management and helping them through that. So we, we offer content conversion management. We also offer editorial services which include uh, copy editing, copywriting, page composition, so on and so forth. And another offering we have is Harmonizer for Content Reuse Analysis. Um, it's a very powerful and low-cost tool to help you determine uh, redundant content and help you clean up and standardize content as you move forward. There's information on Harmonizer on the website. There's also a recorded webinar from November of 2012, I believe, if anyone's interested in that. Next slide, please. So uh, we serve a very broad client base, and you can see from some of these logos, it spans quite a few different industries and both uh, public sector and private sector clients. Next slide, please. And again, uh, just looking at the list of all industries, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but you see uh, a lot of traditional publishing companies, but we also serve a lot of what I call accidental publishers, and those are organizations that publishing isn't their business, but they need to publish information and distribute content as part of their business. So aerospace, associations, uh, so on and so forth, government sector, defense, um, you know, traditional uh, uh, publishers in the scientific, technical, and medical and reference publishing space, uh, just to name a few. So now I'm pleased to introduce Marley Mesabov, who is a content strategist with a passion for the user experience. Her work spans websites, web applications, and mobile for enterprise companies and startups across the country. Marley is an editor at uh, UX Booth, which is an online publication for user experience design, and she's a frequent conference speaker. And, uh, Please welcome Marley, and it's over to you now, Marley. Thank you, Brian. I'm really excited to be presenting today and talking about stories. That's something that I really love. It's something I really love about my work. Um, I am an independent content strategist, and so most of I, what I do, my specialization, is in branding and storytelling. Uh, I'm based out of I'm based out of Boston which is a great place to live for a content strategist because Boston is filled with stories. One of my favorites is the story of Paul Revere, who is said to have announced, the British are coming, the British are coming, warning the revolutionaries of the British Army's arrival. And I get this sense when I hear that story that he had, he had a lot of urgency to him. You, you, know, you could really feel how important this was. And he was also probably enjoying the ride, though. And I believe that when we work with content, particularly during a content migration, we also have that sense of urgency. We know how important it is that we get our work done well and that we get it done in a way that is enjoyable at the same time. We should not be doing our work at the expense of our own enjoyment. We should be doing it in such a way that it is both beneficial to our teams and a lot of fun. So given that this is a webinar about storytelling, I thought I would kick us off with a story that many of you may know. This is the story of the little red hen. Once upon a time, there was a little red hen who lived on a farm. She was friends with a lazy dog, a sleepy cat, and a noisy duck. One day, the little red hen found some seeds on the ground, and she had an idea she would plant the seeds. So she asked her, her friends, who will help me plant the seeds? Not I, barked the lazy dog. Not I, purred the sleepy cat. Not I, quacked the noisy duck. Then I will, said the little red hen. So the little red hen planted the seeds all by herself. When all the seeds had grown into wheat and had been cut, the little red hen asked her friends, who will take the wheat to the mill to be ground? Not I, barked the lazy dog. Not I, purred the sleepy cat. Not I, quacked the noisy duck. Then I'll do it myself, said the little red hen, and she brought the wheat to the mill all by herself. When she returned with the wheat, the little red hen asked her friends, who will help me bake the bread? 
Not I barked the lazy dog. Not I purred the sleepy cat. Not I quacked the noisy duck. Then I will, said the little red hen. So the tired little red hen baked the bread all by herself. When the bread was finished, she asked her friends, Who will help me eat the bread? I will, barked the lazy dog. I will, purred the sleepy cat. I will, quack the noisy yellow duck. No, said the little red hen, I will. And the little red hen ate the bread all by herself. When we think about the little red hen, one thing that always occurs to me is how familiar it is. You probably thought to yourself while I was reading the story, oh, I know that story, but when I heard it, it was a cat, dog, and a rat, or some other animal. But I want you to think for a moment, when is the last time that you actually read The Little Red Hen? Five years ago? Ten years ago? The last time I read it was probably 15 years ago. But it's a story, and stories stick with us. So today, we're going to talk about why we all remember The Little Red Hen, and why stories are so valuable, and how we can use them to make a site migration much easier. First of all, I want to talk about context. There are a couple of reasons that companies tend to begin content migrations, and most of them have to do with either finding out that their current content management system is not working, or perhaps they're t deciding to move all of their content into a CMS for the first time ever. Now, either way, from a business perspective, there are a couple of different pieces that go into this. There's the branding updates, which usually a marketing team will take care of. There's the selection of the content management system, which the development team will take care of. And then there's the content migration. And much like the little red hen, we often feel that we're doing the content migration all by ourselves. And the content migration has a lot more parts to it than just a migration. You know, first we have to audit the content, create new content, archive old content, delete unnecessary content, update content, write adaptive con copy, and we do it all by ourselves. But I think there are some things that we can learn from the Little Red Hen. I don't think we need to do this all by ourselves. The first thing I want us to learn from the Little Red Hen is not to start by baking the bread. We start by planting the seeds. In, a in the story of the Little Red Hen, the very first thing she does is she finds some seeds and she decides to plant them. At that point, this idea that someday she will be sitting down and eating bread, it's a far-off dream. There are so many other things that she could do with the seeds. And in the same way, when we start talking about content, a lot of times it's fueled by deciding that our CMS isn't working or we've got a new CMS and we need to do a content migration. But the content migration is only one possible outcome. There are so many other beneficial things that come from talking about content. And for us, planting the seeds, we're planting seeds in our coworkers' brains. We need to get them thinking about content. We need to ask them, we're going to be auditing this content. What are we auditing it for? Why are we creating new content? When we archive old content, what are we determining is old content? What is what are our guidelines that are going to help us recognize the appropriate pieces? What constitutes old? How will we be updating content? Who are we updating it for? What devices will it be used on? These are all of the questions that I know many of you face every day. And I've certainly come across many times. And that's something that all three parts of, the, of this series we're going to keep coming back to, is the, the story of the content migration. But today, we're going to focus on part one of this, which is how do we find the answers to all of these? The way that we find most of these answers is by determining what the story of our company is. And once we know that, it will be a lot easier to learn what those guidelines are that go along with creating new content or deleting unnecessary content. Um, so I want to dig a little bit into why I keep saying we need to have a story for this. Scientifically, there is a really interesting reason that the Little Red Hen and other stories really stick in our brains. Uh, there were some studies published in 2009 in NeuroImage and a couple of other 
publications that show the people who read fiction are more empathetic. They are also more likely to understand other perspectives in the world around them. And then in 2012, there were some studies where they showed images of MRIs showing that the area of the brain that is active in a storyteller also gets activated in the listener. So for example, if the storyteller is talking about specific emotions, they're talking about being angry, and so the anger portion of their brain is activated because they remember what it feels like as they're telling the story, the listener also begins to feel angry. We're basically learning mind control. We can control the emotions, the ideas, the feelings in other people's brains by telling stories. Let's look at a couple of examples. One anecdotal piece of evidence that I found is actually 27,000 years old. Uh, there have been some, some painted symbols that were found on cave walls in France and Spain, and when the anthropologists looked at them, they saw these patterns, these images of bison and horses, and for a long time they reported on them and said that this was proof that the cave dwellers at the 27,000 years ago were painting images of what was happening in their day to day. They were leaving a mark or letting someone else know. But then more recently, those same archaeologists looked again at these pictures and they found that there were these symbols that were being repeated over and over. And the lines and the symbols that they were noticing now, they actually found were transitional phrases and were uh, other symbols that, are, that aren't needed if you're simply saying, horse is here. But they are needed if you're explaining what happened to you. If you're saying, we went out hunting and we found the horse. After that, we chased it. These, much more simplistic than the stories that we tell now, but they found that these cave paintings, they weren't just notifications, they were stories. And this is the oldest recorded storytelling medium. Then if we fast forward to about 900 BC, we can look, take a look at Greek and Roman mythology. Now, these people didn't know that the cave dwellers several thousand years earlier had been telling stories, but they, they came to the same conclusion, that this was a really great way to explain the world around us. And they used storytelling to explain seasons, to explain the weather, to explain why life was the way that it was. One of my favorites is the story of Pandora's box. Um, in that story, Pandora was created as the first human woman on Earth. There had been gods before that, and there had been titans, but no humans. So each god gave Pandora a, a blessing, a gift. They gave her beauty, they gave her charm, they gave her music, and they gave her curiosity and persuasion. They said that this explained why all women were curious and persuasive, and I assume also beautiful and charming and musical. Anyhow, Zeus gave Pandora a box. That was his gift. Or in the original Greek, it was actually a jar. And he told her that no matter what, she couldn't open it. The box was hers to keep, but she couldn't open it. But you may recall that curiosity was one of the things that had been given to Pandora. So of course, she opened the box, and out flew disease and hatred and war, all these terrible things. But she closed it before hopelessness was able to come out. And the Greeks used this to explain why there were all these evils in the world, and yet how we as humans could still have hope. Rather than simply passing along a moral or a one-line explanation, they created the story that summed up why humanity has hope and why people are the way that they are. Another anecdote about storytelling is uh, the story of Arabian Nights. This is a really interesting story. Uh, according to legend, this, this sultan found that his wife had been cheating on him, so of course he has her beheaded, like you do. Anyhow, he begins marrying a series of virgins. Every night he has a, a marriage, every morning he kills her, getting basically revenge on the whole of womankind. But one night, he has married this new virgin, and she tells him a story. And as she's telling the story, she lets it build up to this really exciting part, and then she stops and says, I'll tell you some more tomorrow. So he decides to let her live one more day so she can continue the story. And this continues on. That night, she tells, she continues the story. 
winds it up, keeps going, gets to another really exciting part, and says, I'll finish it tomorrow night, I'm tired. So this goes on for 1,001 nights. With every night, her leading the story up and then saying, I'll finish it tomorrow, and every day he agrees that she can be allowed to live just one more day. And all this time, he didn't let her live for her beauty or because she was brilliant or because she was funny. He let her live because of the power of her stories. That's a lot of fictional, and that, you know, that's a fictional anecdote, but I also want to talk about some nonfiction context for stories. There's a, an Iranian author who was imprisoned in 2010, and the crime that he committed was writing a story, writing a book, about a series of murders known as the Chain Murders, which took place in Iran from 1988 to 1998. The book was, was a true story, you know, nonfiction book, and the Chain Murders were being committed by the Iranian government. What is particularly interesting about this, though, is that everybody knew the Iranian government was doing this. Everybody knew that these political activists, poets, and authors were dying not from a car crash out of nowhere, and not because of a heart attack, but because it turned out that if you looked into it, the heart attack had been caused by poison. And the car crashes happened in these remote areas and were a one car crash. These were not suicides. They were murders. And the Iranian government didn't care that everybody knew this, but they did care when somebody wrote it down. Because storytelling is influential. And by telling the stories of these murders, Emmett and Baggy made them memorable, and that power terrified the Iranian government. I was also thinking about different ways that we tell stories and how we build a story around our lives when I was listening to NPR last month during the holidays. Ira Glass was asking listeners to share their Christmas stories. And a lot of, you know, he was expecting to hear stories of the one Christmas when this happened. Um, specifically, he wanted to hear about traditions. He wanted to know what cookies did your mother bake? or what did you trim your tree with? But most of the stories that he got were actually not traditions. They were, they were tales. They weren't simple facts. One woman told a story about how she was having lunch on the opposite side of town on Christmas Eve years ago. And she stopped. Uh, she helped an old woman cross the street. And after helping her cross the street, she found out that the woman was actually her neighbor lived all the way across town. And she and this woman started spending Christmas together. She didn't actually tell us anything about what they did every year on Christmas. But it was such an interesting story about this finding this old woman, helping her across the street, finding out that it was the next door neighbor. That was the piece that the woman remembered and wanted to share. So the question that I know that many of you are probably wondering at this point is, what does this have to do for content creation? What does this mean for us? Well, here's the short version. In most cases, long copy has proven more effective than short copy. Just as nobody thought to say, this, my tradition for every Christmas is to eat molasses cookies. No, they tell the story of when they first started having molasses cookies, why it reminded them of their grandmother, what their grandmother used to do with them. Those longer pieces they're much more effective. This is proven true when we look at uh, data and statistics on websites as well. One of the best known case studies on long copy versus short copy was done by conversion rate experts on the Crazy Egg site. Crazy Egg provides analytics reports with information on click-through rates and referral sources and how far people scroll down a page and where on the page they hover the mouse. So they do basically a lot of different types of eye tracking. Through heat map testing and analytics, conversion rate experts determined that Crazy Egg's conversion rate was low in large part because the questions that people had were not being answered on the home page. So instead, visitors were navigating aimlessly through the site, and ultimately they were leaving before converting to customers. What they did was they expanded the home page copy. They made it quite literally 20 times longer than it had been. 
and the, incre the increased crazy eggs conversion rates by over 30%. And it didn't work because the content was longer. It worked because the content was better. So that's a really interesting piece. Long copy is more effective than short copy, but I really want to make sure that everybody's keeping in mind that's not just because it's longer. If you just write lorem ipsum for 20 pages, obviously there's no value to that. But there's longer copy gives us a place to tell a story. Ultimately, before the content did one thing, it told users, crazy eggs, crazy egg lets you see where people click. That's not enough information to really pull people in. So instead, by creating this, this space where the content could answer necessary questions, engage visitors, alert visitors to additional benefits they weren't aware of before, and also these visual cues also help. They create a they, they help with this content to really do more than just one call to action. There's a whole story here about a person with a limited budget who's looking to gather more analytics and the types of tracking they might want to do on their site. It lets us identify with that because we are also people who are budget conscious and have a starting point and then get pulled through to the middle where perhaps we watch this video and we learn more about what we can get and then ultimately we're brought to a point where we're ready to purchase. The key quote that they came away with, which is one of my favorite quotes, is in reality, you cannot have a page that's too long, only one that's too boring. And that's our challenge. When we're putting together content, when we are aligning everything we need to migrate to a new CMS, we need to figure out what content we have that can tell a story. Nike's content strategy team does a really excellent job of providing a story instead of selling a sneaker. I want to be really honest here. Sneakers are not that interesting. Sneakers are a pair of shoes that you can run in. There's nothing, there's nothing enticing about that. If you want to buy a sneaker that'll just cover your foot, you can get one for about 20 bucks, maybe less at Payless. But when you go to Nike and you pay $100 or more for your sneakers, you're doing it because you believe in their story that you can move from who you are to who you dream of being. That you can go from having never gone on a run in your life to being a winner. When you decide to buy a Nike sneaker, you are buying into that dream. And Nike employees remember this story, and that's the deciding factor that they use in every piece of content to keep or delete. Basecamp is another brand that does a really excellent job of telling a story across their website. They're a project management system, and uh, they help people organize projects. So they could have just left Basecamp organizes projects. That could be their important feature, and that could be the one thing that they tell everybody on their website, or they could go into a little more depth. They could tell us a story and bring us into this world where there are thousands of companies who who work just like mountaineers do. From the bottom of the mountain, they need, they need a Sherpa. They go from their base camp at the bottom of the mountain where they get everything that they need, and then they go out to scale great heights. Now, all of a sudden, base camp is a story. And when you look at the basic base camp homepage, they do everything they can to reinforce that idea, everything from their logo, which looks like a mountaintop, to uh, adjectives and descriptive sections that they use that really remind you of that safety. So that's sort of the what. But I want to dig in a little bit to the how. How do we create these stories? Well, we need to tell stories that can be read. And the process that I use to do that is a four-step process. It starts with research. 
And then we'll establish the story, we'll add the necessary details, and we'll distribute it. So step one, the research. The first step to communicating with an audience is listening to what our audience needs. We need to understand what stories they're telling so that we'll understand what stories they'll connect to. And that is essentially user research. Now here's the thing. I hear from a lot of people, I'm not a user researcher, I'm a content strategist, or I'm a copywriter, or I'm a developer, or I'm a something else. I don't care. Good user research is the first step to personalized user content. And I don't care if you are talking to your user researcher and saying, this is the information that I need, or if you're saying, hey, can I sit in on a couple of sessions, or if you're in a small company, you may not have a user researcher. And in that case, it is something that you should be taking on. And it's something that we're all capable of taking on. Certainly, someone who is devoting their life to doing nothing but user research is going to know more about the methods they use, is going to do a much better job, a more detailed job. But we still know the questions that we need to have answers to. We, the type of user research specifically that I find most valuable for this is ethnographic interviews. These are interviews or really conversations designed to do nothing more than listen to how the audience spends their time and how they speak. You can do nothing more than interview five people who have been identified as members of the target audience and get a gestalt of what the target audience sounds like. We can listen to what vocabulary they're comfortable with and we can determine from that how we can best communicate with them. The questions that we need to ask are really simple in this case. A user researcher might have the absolute best possible questions, but even if we do nothing more than say, what do you do at work all day? Tell me about it. Once we learn how much their work impacts their daily life, how much they're using the programs that they currently have, once we learn all sorts of things like that, and more importantly, once we keep asking, they'll realize that you really want to listen to them. And it's also important that you get them comfortable because people's voices, the, the tone of voice that they use and the vocabulary, the, fa the vocabulary that they use changes depending on whether they're comfortable or not. And you want to make sure that they're using a vocabulary that they use in their day-to-day -day life and that they will connect to and that won't reinforce any anxiety for them but will instead reinforce good feelings. I was recently working with a brand new startup that had become a, as an in-person healthy cooking group. And they were all getting these great recipes from each other. They were sharing with the group and, and they loved it. They met about once a month and had potlucks. But they realized that they could do so much more if they started an online community where they could connect with similar minded people across the country. So my first step was to interview the group members who were currently meeting in person. The first group member that I met with was a woman in her, in her 30s. And when we sat down to talk, I, she had so many questions for me. She wanted to know uh, how, how I knew this was going to succeed and what I was going to do and what I recommended. But I, I answered as few questions as I could. And then I asked her how much time she spent online. Well, she hedged. She was a little embarrassed to tell me. I told her I was online far too many hours a day, and she laughed. So I was really tempted to add to that. I was tempted to say, oh, yeah, I'm on my computer until 2 or 3 in the morning. I spent three days straight watching West Wing on Netflix. But I realized that if I did that, I was going to start giving her ideas of how much time I thought she should be spending online or something to compare herself to by saying nothing more than, oh, I spend way too much time online. I let her feel that we had a connection, and yet I didn't put any words in her mouth. I didn't give her a specific time. I didn't give her a specific number. So instead of teaching her more about me, I, I laughed with her, and then I gave her a chance to open up. 
Um, what's more is that once she realized I was honestly interested in hearing about her day, she told me all about the website she generally visited. And then by the time I'd listened to five different people, I was starting to see patterns. All five of them had full-time jobs and spent most of their online time was in the evenings. Four of them had families, and so they really struggled to focus on the online reading. And none of them felt secure about the time they spent online. They mostly assumed that if something went wrong online, that was their fault, that they weren't doing it correctly. So they often gave up on watching a video or sending an email if the link didn't load quickly enough or if they couldn't remember their password to use a site. I could never have guessed before the interviews that those would be the patterns I would find, but it doesn't matter what patterns you expect to find. You'll only find them by sitting down and listening to the people that you're going to be writing for. The next step is we need to establish the story. This, this creative part, is the hardest part, but I also think it's the most fun part. This is where we need to determine what is the beginning, what is the middle, and what is the end of this scenario. Let's talk about fairy tales again, because that's a really easy way to see a really clear beginning, middle, and end. Little Red Riding Hood. She wants to go visit her grandmother. That's the beginning of the story. Really simple. In the middle, she meets the wolf who eats her and her grandmother. At the end of the story, the huntsman kills the wolf, and Red Riding Hood lives happily ever after. For a company, we do a really similar story. Let's look at uh, Motorola. Let's talk about the Moto X. This is a new phone. So we've got, we've got Joe. Joe wants to send, spend more time with his family. And remember, this is Joe's story. It's not just the Moto X's story. In the middle, Joe buys the new Moto X phone, which allows him to work from anywhere. And at the end of the story, Joe leaves the office early, he takes his family on a picnic because he can check in from, with the office from anywhere, and they all live happily ever after. Just like that, just as simply as we did with a fairy tale, we can create a story that makes our product a successful element and helps us understand more about our target audience using those patterns that we had realized that most of our people have a family and that they work very busy jobs. Maybe these are pieces that Moto X came up with and found that will help them to tell their story. Now we can do that with any company. Um, for the startup that I was working with, once I identified those vocabulary patterns, I determined that since most of the target audience was busy parents who were interested in cooking, a really good beginning to my story would be that Sally needs a recipe to make chicken. Um, her mother-in-law is coming over tonight and she really wants to impress her. They've had a tough relationship in the past and she, her mother told her that she liked cooking and she told her mother-in-law that she was also excited about cooking and so she, there's, there's a lot. The stakes are high. So in the middle, Sally goes online to her recipe website, this community that we're creating. And since I know that she's nervous about using sites correctly, I added in that the chicken recipes, they'll be bookmarked. This is a requirement. This is a functional piece that I want to make sure that we include. And as a result, because her chicken recipes were right there, easy to find, Sally has a stress-free day. She makes a wonderful dinner. She repairs her relationship with her mother-in-law. Yay! A happy ending. We all live happily ever after. Ultimately, this is the kind of story, this beginning, middle, and end, is what we need to do for every company, for every product. Step three is adding the details. So I said that stories give us context, but it's not just the context of the product. We need to see that this story doesn't exist in a vacuum. We need to add details. For example, when we look if we look at Goldilocks and the Three Bears, maybe we start off with just a person who goes to a stranger's house and a story happens. But we can add in these details that make a whole brand out of what was initially just one product or one piece of the story. Um, Home Depot does a really great job with this. Home Depot has created a Twitter feed that is really interesting and it's because the articles aren't just about construction. They are about all sorts of things that entertain Home Depot's customers. In this case, they, they understand that 
their their customers they have gloves they like winter sports they need everything that a family needs instead of just the one piece that you come to Home Depot to buy for the startup we want to go beyond food we need to understand what our social media what our emails what every communication might be able to pull in that would connect to our target audience's lives and so I looked at what else they had in common these were predominantly women with careers and families a lot of them wanted a hobby but they felt really guilty doing anything that didn't also take care of their kids or take care of some of their work so in addition to cooking they were interested in really anything that felt productive they were tempted by any kind of discount massages or time-saving suggestions they loved things that they could do with their kids and also with the community and so we were able to offer them more than just a website we were offered we were able to offer them a solution and this brings us to the last step distributing the last piece and what absolutely makes a story a story is the ability to distribute it it's commonly said in theater that a show is not complete unless it has an audience and a story doesn't have to have an audience but it's a lot better if it does otherwise it's just sitting in your lonely little corner of the web so the best part is that our story because it has all those details that we've added it's a whole brand now it has multiple parts part of it exists in a commercial it also exists on the website on the Facebook page anywhere and that story that brand is our communication tool we can engage our audience by offering articles or videos or cartoons or news that interests them wherever they are and it doesn't matter where they are it just matters that we are where they are so you're not doing it wrong if you find that you were trying Twitter but none of your users are there just get off Twitter if your users aren't on Twitter if they're on if they're on Facebook you get on Facebook if they're on Instagram you get on Instagram if they're not using social media find out what they are using it might even be somewhere in real life and then once we can participate once we know where they are we can participate in their conversations and find out what information they're looking for that we can offer so we don't want to be spam mail we want to be the answer to the questions that they're asking I spent months with the startup company doing user interviews and reviewing the business goals and creating an internal brand guidelines and a vocabulary for the users but every time that we talked about marketing they got really nervous they got occasional visitors through search when we first launched their site but their Facebook page was dead and Twitter was silent and the real breakthrough came when we found that a lot of people were on Quora asking about recipes so we went to Quora we were able to reference blog posts that they'd written in some of the answers or just get conversations started and in that way we actually started convincing some people on Quora to come follow us on Twitter well once the Quora users started using Twitter because on Twitter we'd explain to them that they could get faster links and we could get some communications going where we could add some quotes for them well then all of a sudden we found this broader audience that had other similar patterns and similar uh, to our audience and the whole thing just it spreads you get a little distribution going and it just spreads and spreads so I want to leave you with a quick overview of what we've gone through today which is essentially that once we build a story we will be able to answer all those questions that we're coming up with as the little red hen we're going to create a story and build the brand around that story the story is the most important piece is that it shows the value of your product we personalize it to the target audience based on what we learn from them and what they're telling us we can use all different mediums to help grow the story as long as we're going to the places where our users are visiting and once we're there we can keep interacting with our audience we'll bring them our our content so that they can understand and see all of its value so that they're never feeling like we're bombarding them we just keep turning up at the opportune moments 
And once that's in place, we can trust the story. If we build it and enjoy it and share it, they will come. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I think we're going to be taking questions. Is that right, Brian? Uh, yes, please. So if you have questions, please type them into the, uh, the interface on your control panel, and we'll be glad to uh, to answer them. Uh, Marley, I just want to thank you for um, a, a wonderful presentation so far. This is, uh, as we've said, this is a, a, the first of a three-part series. Um, we have two other uh, sessions coming up, one on February 20th, uh, which will be around finding your brand personality, and then the the final session in the series on March 27th is around collaboration and how that can be fun for your whole team. So uh, uh, please take a few minutes to, uh, to ask some questions here. And, and Marley, I want to particularly thank you for uh, giving me back a piece of my childhood with that little red hen story. <laughs> I uh, had visions of uh, laying in bed with the uh, sheets and blanket up to my neck and my mother sitting on the bed reading that to me. So that was that was awesome. That was <laughs> awesome. Um, and uh, so we've got uh, we've got a couple of questions here. The, the first one is, um, how do you recommend that I get my team on board to user? I'm sorry to uh, to use storytelling. That's a really interesting question. Um, that's going to depend a lot on the team, but by and large, I've found that people, the biggest concern that a lot of teams have is this is going to take too much time. This is going to be a waste of our time or it's going to just take too long and we need something to get done now. And I think uh, starting with an example of the simplicity of the story, whether it's the Moto X story or um, or Nike, or creating a really basic outline of a story for your team, that can get a lot of people on board because it's, you know, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's using storytelling to, to explain the power of stories. Um, and as long as we show them that value rather than just trying to tell them, uh, then we get a lot more people, a lot more buy-in. And as, I mean, show them the, uh, the case study from conversion rate experts. Statistics do a lot to prove our points. Great, great. Um, another question just came in, but please, if, uh, if any of you uh, have other questions, we do have uh, plenty of time left. We've got, uh, we've got about another 12 or 13 minutes available to continue this conversation. Um, the, the next question uh, that came in is, is can, I, can I build a story if my company wants to keep their copy short? How do we go about doing that? Oh, absolutely. Um, when it comes down to it, when, if we want to have short copy, that's fine. We just need to make sure that there's something behind it. In a way, I think about like the tip of the iceberg, the, the content that they might see on the website is just that tiny little tip of the iceberg, but we've got a whole brand below it. So maybe your tagline is nice and short and sweet and to the point, but it's backed up by the conversation that happens when they email you to get your services or when they call customer service. It really, you need buy-in across the entire organization to support, to support having the full brand, the full story, but that doesn't mean that you need to tell everything on your home page. Right, great. So a another question just came in as we were um, talking about, um, you know, keeping things short, and uh, I, I think you, you pretty much answered it, but, but maybe um, as I read the question, you might want to add to it. My organization has just adopted the concept of minimalism. We try to make our content shorter, not longer, shorter and longer in caps. Uh, what do we do? Is, is there anything to add to that, that last question? Um, I think it's also a good idea to look at what you've already got, because what, basically what's not working with your current content? <clears throat> is the problem actually that's too long or is the problem that it's not engaging enough? 
And once you know the answer to that, then you'll know. So, for example, when I said um, during our user research portion and we learn how our customers speak, maybe the problem is that your copy is too long because the sentences, the way that your audience communicates is in much shorter clips. And if that's the case, then you can take that same uh, story that you're trying to tell, but tell it in shorter blips. But if the problem is that you're not telling the right story, then you may want to gear them away from minimalism and towards making sure that we're telling them something engaging and something that they find to be of value rather than that we hope they will find a value or that we think they should find valuable. Right, right. I, I think also, and, and you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I would be completely wrong, you know, there, there's, there's a difference between marketing copy and, and, and documentation, things geared towards uh, user instruction and such, uh, where um, there can be a balance uh, with documentation, minimalism is all the thing, but with marketing copy it has to be effective because that's that's how you're telling your story to to your consumers. The, the documentation is typically looked at after the consumer has become, um, or the, 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 the prospect has become a, a, a client and they're, they're now consuming your content around your product. So. Um, Anything you want to say about the differenti differentiation between marketing content and and the more focused documentation around a product or service offering? Yeah, I I agree with you that there is a difference, but a brand does need to be the same across across the board. So I would say, and on and the customer journey isn't over when the product is purchased. You know, ideally right. we continue to have a relationship with them and we want to make sure that we're consistent so that so that the, the language that we're using to give them the documentation is still the same voice that they're used to hearing from us in marketing. So there's definitely a right. connection. Right. Okay, great. Um, one other question just came in. Uh, do you have an example of a company that switched archetypes and if so, uh, how did that work for them? Ah, um, so maybe switching from one pattern to another one. Um, I think it depends. The The big element here is, like I said, consistency. And that last piece that I put where we need to trust the story, we don't want them to switch stories if if uh, the problem is that we haven't given our, we need to make sure we're giving our audience time <laughs> to actually buy into it and actually get involved. And I see a lot of companies give up on a story that they've identified because, because they're not hearing from their users. Um, when in actuality, we need to remember that there's a whole solar system of internet out there. And just because there's one, you know, we're one tiny, your website is one itty bitty tiny little star. And so just because everybody isn't coming flocking to you, make sure that they know where to find you. And make sure that you're reaching out and speaking to them. Uh, and, and that can help you to understand if the problem was actually that you are, that you don't have the right story going on, or if you haven't given your story a fair chance because maybe it's actually the outreach that needs a little more, a little more push. Right, right. Okay, um, another question that came in, and uh, this is also one that's interesting to me, um, and, and I'll interject when I read the question and then, then you can answer. Doesn't the medium also determine the length, for instance, web equals short and sweet and printed, or ebook equals more details? and just you know, my personal view, having come from um, over 30 years of publishing technology and starting out really with print before the advent of web, you know, you were while you aren't limited in print, you want to limit what you print uh, because of the cost of developing and delivering print products. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the web is, you know, it's you push out as much information as you want. Your your web page or pages can be as long as they want doesn't matter. 
Um, just what's your thought on that? I mean, my thought is is the web doesn't need to be short and sweet. That's where you can really express more of your your value in your story than um, than a print budget might allow. Your thoughts, Marley? For a long time, I think we were hearing this idea that you had to be short and sweet on the web. I think that went hand in hand with everything having to be above the fold. Yeah. But I I think it's just not true anymore, particularly when you consider that people are reading Kindles, are using Kindles to read full books, are using um, you know the Nook and the and the iPad to to read books, and then on top of that. Um, I think about the fact that we're seeing something like 60%, don't quote me on that, I don't know if that's accurate, but uh, a very large percentage of um, online time is, is mobile now. Yep. And we're hearing the same thing there where it's, oh, print, you can do all you want, web has to be short and sweet. Web, you can do all you want, mobile has to be short and sweet. Well, it's just not true. If the information is valuable, and the information needs to get to your audience, then it needs to get to your audience. Um, I do believe that you'll find that certain certain target audiences are not using Kindles and are not and don't enjoy reading on the web. And for those pe for those audiences, you 100% want to keep your web content more more brief and expand more in print mediums. But if you have an audience that is fully on mobile, you better make sure their mobile experience has the full story. Right, right. Thank you. Um, no more questions in the window right now. If anybody has a question, please uh, submit it. I just want to uh, um, point out that you can reach out to DCL. Uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Linda Marone Casola's contact information is here, elcasola at dclab.com. Um, I didn't put up my contact information, but you can reach me at B Trombley, that's B T R O M B L E Y at dclab.com. And Marley, uh, Marley's website is www.marley.us and on Twitter at Mars and the Stars. Um, and I'm and always let's... happy to answer more questions via Twitter. Great. Great. Any, uh, any final questions, please submit them now. And, uh, Please remember February 20th, again at 1 p.m., uh, Part 2, Finding Your Brand Personality, and on the 27th of March, uh, the final of this three-part series, Collaboration, fun for the whole team. Um, also in the webinar, you'll see a list of, of other uh, webinars uh, that we have upcoming over the next few months, and uh, there is a link someplace on the, the new website uh, for our webinar archive. Uh, which has recordings of all the webinars for probably the past two or three years, covering a number of topics um, and um, a, a number of focus areas. Um, uh, so please uh, feel free to visit. And uh, there's no more questions coming in. Is there anything you want final uh, to leave us with, Marley? Just trust your stories. <laughs> Great, and, um, great. Yeah, thank great. you so much, Brian. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, we're, we're pleased to have you, and we thank you for um, carving out uh, time from your busy day, uh, not, not just for this session, but for the, uh, the other two sessions coming up next month and the month after. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody, and uh, please feel free to reach out to us or to Marley if you have any further questions. Thanks so much. Goodbye. All right. Bye-bye.